At 11 p.m. on the 10th of May 1941, a lone Messerschmitt fighter bomber flew over Scotland just south of Glasgow. Anti-aircraft batteries spotted the German plane, but were ordered not to open fire. The pilot rolled the aircraft over and dropped towards the ground. As he parachuted into a field, he injured his ankle. He was immediately arrested. The pilot identified himself as Alfred Horn and demanded to see the Duke of Hamilton, who lived nearby. During the interrogation, British command discovered his true identity. He was Rudolf Hess, deputy Führer of Nazi Germany, one of the masterminds behind the Third Reich. So why did he take this mysterious flight? Recent evidence sheds new light on covert deals, desperate peace negotiations, and the involvement of the royal family. This program uncovers the true story of Rudolf Hess in one of the greatest secrets of the Second World War. The life of Rudolf Hess, deputy to Adolf Hitler, began far from the Third Reich. He was born in Alexandria on the 26th of April, 1894, the son of a German importer. During the Great War, Hess served in an elite unit of stormtroopers. He was assigned to the same regiment as another young soldier, Adolf Hitler. The two men forged a bond that would last for decades. In the Battle of Verdun, Hess, however, was shot in the chest. After an extensive period of recovery, he became a lieutenant in the German Air Force and learned to fly. After the war, Hess joined the Freikorps and recruited several ex-army men who shared his political convictions, blaming the government for Germany's defeat in the war and accusing socialists and Jews of backstabbing. Hess became a political street fighter. He joined his old comrade Adolf Hitler in the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923 an attempt to overthrow the government in Munich. Both men were sentenced to seven months in Landsberg prison, cementing their friendship. While in Landsberg, Hitler dictated Mein Kampf to Rudolf Hess. After the men were released, Hess became Hitler's private secretary, the first move in his unstoppable rise to power. In 1932, Hitler made him chairman of the Central Political Commission of the Nazi Party. A year later, he was appointed deputy Führer, one of the most powerful positions in the Third Reich. Hess's rise was nothing short of meteoric. Now at the heart of the party, he was involved in the selection of all senior Nazi officials. At major rallies, it was Hess who introduced Hitler with absolute loyalty and passion. Mein Führer, um Sie stehen die Fahnen und Standarten dieses Nationalsozialismus. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. But in August 1939, their friendship underwent a dramatic reversal. As war fast approached, Hitler turned to the head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, and named him as his successor. It was a massive blow to Hess, making him third in line of succession. 
and his involvement with major political events immediately began to wane. It was Goering who organized the Anschluss, annexing Austria to Germany. It was Goering who led the Blitzkrieg on Poland. It was Goering who was larger than life and popular amongst most Germans. Hess, on the other hand, was moody, too serious and too fervent in his public appearances. Albert Speer was aware of the contrasts. I would say that Hess was an idealist, in some way uh, opposed to Hitler, who was, was a pragmatist. Uh, in 1940, uh, I heard Hitler saying, after he had a long conversation with Göring, uh, Göring always is stimulating me when I have some problems to talk with him. But when Hess is coming and has, his, um, has problems to be solved of the party mostly, it's really a nuisance to me because he is so stubborn, so um, um, uh, doesn't give in, and it needs hours and hours, and afterwards I'm really feeling very tired of him. For two decades, Hess had thrived in his service to Hitler and the Nazi party. He now had to prove that he too was a man of action. The first year of war was a tremendous success for the Nazi regime. Poland, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium and France all fell. Goering had more than delivered his promises. His bombers and fighter planes overwhelmed all opposition. But then, in June 1940, Goering boasted that his Luftwaffe could easily destroy Britain's RAF. Hitler seized the opportunity and began planning Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain. Through all these triumphant events, Rudolf Hess, still number three in the Third Reich, was increasingly left out. Hess was baffled at his sudden loss of control. He had to do something or he would die politically. He didn't believe Britain was Germany's natural enemy. It was the Soviet Union. If Hess could secure a peace, it might be the only way out of an increasingly desperate situation. Although Britain and Germany were at war in 1940, Hitler wanted to avoid fighting Britain to the bitter end. He stated he was willing to leave the island alone, if Germany was allowed a free hand in mainland Europe. Meanwhile, Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess watched his own power within the Nazi party disintegrate. If he could strike a peace deal with Britain, he would win back Hitler's favor. Hess was encouraged by his former teacher, Professor Karl Haushofer. And Haushofer's son, Albrecht, a close friend and dedicated Nazi. But Albrecht also believed Hitler was an impediment to victory. No British government would trust him, and that he must be removed before peace could be made. Hess did not agree. He would start the negotiations himself. Hess was confident he would find sympathetic ears in Britain. But the political landscape was extremely complex. At the forefront in the battle against Germany was Prime Minister Winston Churchill. History has judged him one of the greatest leaders. But at the time, he was not respected by everyone in Britain. He'd only been Prime Minister since May 1940, and many regarded him as a maverick politician, an adventurer and an opportunist. It was only his consistent opposition to Nazism since the early 1930s 
that made him the right man for the job. He epitomized his country's defiance during the Battle of Britain, and the people loved him for it. But there were many other politicians and members of the British establishment who did not share his no-compromise attitude. His predecessor, Neville Chamberlain, had wanted to negotiate a deal with Hitler and avoid war. He was only too aware that Britain was not ready to fight Germany. In September 1938, Chamberlain had signed away part of Czechoslovakia to appease Hitler's desire for power in Central Europe. Returning home, Chamberlain was confident of peace. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. On the 30th of September 1938, he appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace with George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Unprecedented for the royal family, as traditionally the monarch is not permitted to be involved in politics. This public appearance sent a strong signal to the Nazis. The British royal family was sympathetic to peace with Germany. The royal family had always had strong ties with Germany. Queen Victoria's grandson was Kaiser Wilhelm II, who had led Germany during the Great War. But George VI was a cautious figure, who took his responsibilities seriously and would not allow his sympathies for Germany to go too far. But that was not the case with his brothers, the Duke of Kent and the Duke of Windsor. They, along with many members of the British establishment, openly admired Hitler's restoration of order and prosperity to Germany. They fervently did not want war and would consider almost any price to maintain the peace. A key figure in secret peace missions between the royal family and Germany was Wing Commander Sir Louis Gregg. Special assistant to the Duke of Kent, he was a close friend of the royal family and regularly played tennis with the king. In May 1939, Gregg visited Berlin on a secret mission to assess the political situation for the king and maintain contact with senior Nazis, including, of course, Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess. But sympathy for Nazi Germany went even further with the King's other brother, the Duke of Windsor. In 1936, he put his own interests first, abdicating as monarch to marry Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. After giving up the throne, he was created the Duke of Windsor and moved abroad. In 1937, he visited Nazi Germany and met Hitler. Even after the outbreak of war, he retained some sympathy for the Nazi cause. For Hitler, the respect was mutual. He even considered the Duke a possible puppet head of state if Germany invaded Britain. But it was not only members of the royal family and Neville Chamberlain who were eager for peace with the Nazis. Other key members of the British government also wanted to negotiate a deal with Hitler. Britain suffered huge losses during the Great War. Over 900,000 dead. Still a recent and bitter memory, and many influential members of the British establishment declared it should never happen again. Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, was also a major supporter of Chamberlain's appeasement policy. On the 9th of June 1939, just three months before the outbreak of war, a secret meeting was held at the Foreign Office in London. It was chaired by Lord Halifax and included several foreign delegations. 
The Germans were represented by Duke Adolf zu Mecklenburg, a strong supporter of the Nazi regime. Wing Commander Sir Louis Gregg, special assistant to the Duke of Kent, was also present. There is no record of the purpose of the meeting, but it most likely concerned avoiding conflict with Germany. With such senior members of the British establishment interested in peace, it wasn't surprising that Hess thought he could broker a deal. But by September 1939, Chamberlain's policy of appeasement had convinced Hitler that Britain would not fight. And on this error of judgment, Winston Churchill came to power in 1940. In Germany, however, Hess's career was deteriorating rapidly. He was sure key figures in the British establishment, including the royal family, would still welcome a gesture of peace from Nazi Germany. His political future depended upon it. As Britain fought for survival in the skies over southern England in the summer of 1940, not every Englishman supported the war. There were some who would have preferred to see a deal struck between Britain and Nazi Germany. They were the remnants of former Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's party of appeasers, who tried to avoid war during the 1930s. Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess believed that if he could get to these men, he could still orchestrate a spectacular peace deal. Among those individuals Hess targeted was a young British MP, the Marquis of Clydesdale, a handsome young man of action and no stranger to popular acclaim and success. In 1933, he led an expedition by air to explore the Himalayas. At a time when aircraft were still primitive and unable to fly at high altitudes, it was a brave and risky adventure. He was the first man to fly over Mount Everest and wrote a dramatic account of his journey in the Pilot's Book of Everest. A copy of this book, signed from English friends, found its way into the hands of Rudolf Hess. In 1936, the Marquis attended the Olympic Games in Berlin with many members of the British establishment. There, they openly expressed their admiration for Hitler and what he'd achieved for his people. Their attitude was summed up by Major Featherston Godley of the British Legion in a conversation with Hitler and Hess caught on film. We British never felt anything but respect for our German enemies in the war years across the other side of the trenches. 49 nations attended the 1936 Olympic Games and it was here that Clydesdale first met Rudolf Hess an allegation later denied by Clydesdale's family. But Clydesdale was one of the key members of the Anglo-German Fellowship and one of the people present at the secret meeting held to discuss peace with Germany just months before the outbreak of war. Just one month after war had been declared, Clydesdale had a letter published in the Times on the 6th of October 1939. In it, he hoped a negotiated settlement could be made between honourable men. The article made its way to Hess. It was just the message he wanted to hear. In 1940, Clydesdale succeeded his father as the Duke of Hamilton. Hess knew that Churchill was the major obstacle to brokering a peace deal. He would have to bide his time and wait for his moment. By September 1940, RAF pilots had taken on and defeated the best of the Luftwaffe. At the height of the battle on the 15th of September, the RAF shot down 56 German planes, losing only 26 themselves. Hermann Goering, commander of the Luftwaffe, had lost the Battle of Britain. Hitler had no choice but to postpone his planned invasion. The Battle of Britain was a critical turning point for Hess. With Goering's failure, Hess could shine. 
But Hitler already had his mind on other projects. Russia. Hess vacillated, not sure of his next move. If he went to Britain and botched the negotiations, the consequences would be devastating. The risk seemed too great, and he continued to lie low, waiting in the shadows. In Britain, victory renewed interest in a negotiated settlement with the Nazis. But Churchill immediately rejected the idea. He believed any agreement that left the Nazis in power would lead to greater problems in the future. He seized the moment and moved against his remaining enemies within the British establishment. As the most influential figure within the royal family, the Duke of Windsor had openly expressed his support for Hitler. With the fall of France in May 1940, he and Wallace flew to Lisbon rather than return to Britain. There, the Germans quietly sounded him out regarding peace negotiations. To their delight, he referred to Churchill as a warmonger. But before he could cause more trouble, Churchill had him move to the Caribbean. There, he was appointed governor of the Bahamas for the rest of the war, thwarting him from doing any further damage. Neville Chamberlain, the architect of the Munich Agreement, remained a member of the War Cabinet, but was now in poor health. He died in November 1940. Lord Halifax, at one time Chamberlain's chosen successor as Prime Minister and a major supporter of appeasement, was Churchill's most powerful opponent in government. As Foreign Secretary, he was the second most important person in the War Cabinet. But in December 1940, with Chamberlain dead, Halifax became the victim of a cabinet reshuffle when Churchill appointed him ambassador to the United States. It was a shrewd move. By removing Halifax, he denied the appeasers their most powerful political leader. Churchill then strengthened his position by replacing Halifax with Anthony Eden, a pro-war, pro-Churchill figure. In Nazi Germany, Hess carefully monitored all these political changes. It was a severe setback. If only he'd acted earlier, he could have dealt directly with the Duke of Windsor and Halifax. But now they were gone. The Duke of Hamilton, once an avid supporter, had distanced himself from pro-German circles by joining the RAF. As a serving officer, his devotion to Britain couldn't be doubted, but his behaviour throughout the war raised disturbing questions. Was his enlistment merely a cover for his continuing manoeuvrings within the British establishment? Hess still considered him a major point of contact well into 1941. Early that year, Hitler had a new obsession, the invasion of the Soviet Union. If he could defeat Joseph Stalin, Europe would be his. But that meant opening up a second front. Hess hoped to avoid this by eliminating Britain from the war with a peace treaty. If successful, it would be a huge strategic victory and a personal triumph. Hitler could devote all his resources to defeating Stalin without having to think about Churchill. And for Hess, his status within the Nazi regime would be secure. In May 1941, he made his decision. In the spring of 1941, Rudolf Hess was the third most important man in the Third Reich. But on the afternoon of the 10th of May, he left all his official Nazi duties behind him. That day, he stayed at home with his wife and three-year-old son. Over tea, he explained that he was going on a journey. He said he would not be away for too long, and kissed them both goodbye. Frau Ilse Hess recalled her last day with her husband. And I was a little bit suspicious and I asked him, uh, when will you be back? 
he said, oh, I'll have a plane flying this afternoon in Augsburg, and then I'm going with the train to Berlin. I think I'll be back on Monday. And I looked at him and said, I don't think that you will be back on Monday. He just was startled because at this moment he thought, does she know anything or has she a suspicion? I had none. I only thought he, will, he won't be back on Monday. Hess was driven from his home in Munich to an airfield in Augsburg. There he climbed into a Messerschmitt ME-110, which had had its guns deactivated and its bombs removed. It would be a one-way trip only, as on board there wasn't enough fuel for his return. The deputy Führer was dressed as a Luftwaffe flight lieutenant. Over the previous few months, despite being forbidden by Hitler to fly, Hess had secretly been honing his long-distance flying skills. Equipped with only a map on which he'd penciled his course, he started up the aircraft's engine. Flying solo, he followed an 800-mile route to Scotland. His map showed he flew northwest until he reached the Dutch coast. He followed this for a short distance before turning northwest again over the North Sea and out of range of British radar. It was a trip fraught with danger. Because the flight had not been reported to the German air authorities, he ran the risk of being shot down by German night fighters or anti-aircraft batteries. Once Hess reached the same latitude as Glasgow, he turned directly west towards Dungavel, seat of the Duke of Hamilton. When he flew over the city of Glasgow, searchlights picked out his aircraft, but anti-aircraft guns were instructed not to fire. Shortly afterwards, Hess made his first parachute jump. He struggled to get out of the cockpit, but the air pressure kept him locked in his seat. The only way he could escape was to roll the plane over so he could drop out. He fell to earth in a field as his aircraft crashed. It was a remarkable achievement of navigation. He was very close to where he wanted to be, but not close enough. Just eight miles away was Dungavel House, the family home of the Duke of Hamilton, Hesse's intended first point of contact. Dungavel House also had a hangar and runway, making it the perfect place to land. A local woman would later report seeing landing lights turned on along the runway, but Hess could not find it in time and parachuted into a nearby field. But rather than being met by the Duke of Hamilton, Hess was confronted by a farmer armed with a pitchfork. David McLean quickly became something of a national celebrity. Yes, I'm the man that captured Rudolf Hess. Little did I realize at the time the important man he turned out to be. I helped him to his feet and into the cottage, where we made tea, but the man refused tea and would only have a drink of water. Hess was quickly taken into custody by local military officers, who interrogated him in a nearby Girl Scouts club hall. Captain Graham Donald recalled discovering his true identity. I asked him for his autograph. So he gave me a, an autograph, which he did write rather laboriously and carefully, and signing himself as Alfred Horn. And uh, then I said, but Alfred, surely. Alfred's not a very Germanic name. It's Anglo-Saxon. In Anglo-Saxon, it uh, really means uh, Alf the Red. In German, it should surely be Rotolf or uh, Rudolf. Well, I could see he was really worried. In fact, I knew that he, he knew that he'd been spotted, I think, and all sure of that. I just said to him, I will now pass in my reports and your message to the Duke of Hamilton tonight and tell him that you give your name as Hauptmann Alfred Horn, but that I know your correct name is Rudolf Hess the deputy Führer of the German Reich. During his interrogation, Hess repeatedly insisted on seeing the Duke of Hamilton. 
At the time of the flight, Hamilton was commanding officer at the nearby airbase RAF Turnhaus. He steadfastly refused to see Hess and was later criticized for his questionable behavior. Some thought that if he wasn't expecting Hess, he would want to see the man purporting to be Germany's deputy Führer, if only out of curiosity. The King's brother, the Duke of Kent, was also in Scotland on the same evening as Hess's arrival. It was the Duke's aide, Wing Commander Sir Louis Gregg, who was among those present at the secret Foreign Office meeting in 1939, in which the possibility of doing a deal with leading Nazis was discussed. But Hess's failure to arrive secretly destroyed any intended meeting with Hamilton or the Duke of Kent. The message that Hess brought to Hamilton and his supporters was simple. Britain and Germany must unite against Bolshevik Russia. Britain could keep her empire so long as Germany was allowed a free hand in Europe. Britain also had to hand back Germany's colonies lost in the Great War, evacuate Iraq and conclude an armistice with Mussolini. Finally, Churchill would have to resign as Prime Minister. But once Hess had been arrested, members of the British establishment acted quickly to distance themselves from the fiasco. Involvement with a senior Nazi was treason, punishable by death. The Duke of Hamilton was criticized for his handling of the events of that night, but continued to display his devotion to the war effort by serving in the RAF. Secretly, however, he appealed to Churchill for mercy. A few days later, a carefully worded statement was made in the House of Commons, which cleared Hamilton of any direct involvement in the plot. The Duke of Kent continued his work for the RAF, becoming an air commodore in the welfare section of the Inspector General's staff. In Germany, word finally reached Hitler of Hesse's disastrous flight to Britain. Nazi radio broadcasts announced Hess was suffering from mental illness. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels released the following statement. It seems that party member Hess lives in a state of hallucination, as a result of which he felt he would bring about an understanding between England and Germany. The National Socialist Party regrets that this idealist fell a victim to his hallucination. This will have no effect on the continuance of the war which has been forced on Germany. But how much did Hitler really know of the secret mission? It's more than likely he was aware of Hesse's interest in opening negotiations for peace. After all, a diplomatic success would suit Hitler, but he would never have condoned his deputy's personal flight. In custody in Scotland, military doctors put Hess through a series of psychological tests. Dr. Gibson Graham recalled his behavior. He was admitted he was a man of tremendous dignity. He was of great superiority. It stood out. He was almost elated. But after I had made a careful examination of him, he showed himself as a most introspective hypochondriac. Was Hess on the verge of a psychological breakdown? A recent investigation has revealed fascinating details of the 15 months following his capture. From his cell, Hess may still have been involved in a plot with a member of the royal family to secure peace. By the late summer of 1942, Rudolf Hess had been jailed and repeatedly questioned as to the reason behind his bizarre flight. It was assumed that his capture destroyed any attempt to make peace with Germany. But recently revealed documents suggest otherwise. Three months after Hesse's disastrous flight, the Duke of Kent took off from the east coast of Scotland in a Sunderland flying boat. He was accompanied by 14 other men, 
and was officially on a morale-boosting visit to an RAF crew stationed in Iceland. It was later described as a special mission. But 60 miles into the flight, disaster struck. The aircraft crashed into a remote hilltop called Eagle's Nest near Caithness. Only one man survived the crash. The Duke of Kent was amongst those killed, making his death the most senior loss suffered by the royal family during the Second World War. Recently, it's been claimed that the Duke of Kent's last journey was in fact a secret mission to neutral Sweden. According to this theory, Hess, far from being imprisoned in Britain, was actually on board the aircraft as a vital member of the peace mission. Fifteen known passengers and fifteen bodies were found at the crash site. Most were burned beyond recognition. Yet someone survived and went for help. Who was it? The theory further claims that the British government kept a double of Hess imprisoned in Britain, presumably to foil any rescue or assassination attempts. It was alleged that the real Hess was on board the doomed aircraft, spearheading the secret peace process, and that it was Hess's double who was put on trial after the war. Drugs administered to Hess may have affected his mind, but if this theory is correct, this man could not remember anything about Hess's past, precisely because he wasn't Hess. It also explains why distinctive wounds from the First World War were not found on Hess's body during his imprisonment in Spandau. Hess was shot through the left lung in the First World War, yet consultant surgeon Dr. Hugh Thomas could find no evidence of the wound when examining him. I expected to see very considerable evidence, an obvious frontal wound, an exit wound, and an operative scar of some considerable dimensions. I saw none of this. But further research among First World War medical records in Munich suggests that Hesse's wounds could have been more minor than reported and could have healed almost completely, leaving little trace of the injury. Whatever the case, Many members of the British aristocracy and establishment were involved in a conspiracy to strike a peace deal with Hitler, despite Churchill's defiance. Central to this plan was Hesse's flight. But rather than exploit the conspiracy, surprisingly, Churchill buried the incident. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels couldn't understand why the British didn't publicize the capture. Goebbels later declared he would have done that had the roles been reversed. But Churchill played a more subtle political game. By keeping Hess out of the public eye, he disarmed his opponents and thwarted any public discourse of a negotiated settlement with the Nazis. For Churchill, the total obliteration of the Nazi regime was the only acceptable outcome. His political savvy was correct. Hess disappeared from public view. The British peace conspirators had been defeated. As for Hess, he was transferred briefly to the Tower of London, where Churchill ordered him to be treated as a medical rather than a criminal case. He was then transferred to a prison near Aldershot and given a simple room on the first floor. Military psychiatrist Dr. Henry Dix observed his mental decline. I was ushered into Hess's room, introducing myself as his new doctor. I found a glowering, sad-faced man looking into the distance, uh, Im immensely angry uh, and inaccessible. And I said to myself, goodness me, this is a sick man, which, uh, of course, as it turned out, it was true. And um, it wasn't very long before one discovered his very deep sense of persecution and um, fear of interference. For example, with his food, when he would have to change plates um, or pieces of meat with one of us 
uh, sitting at table with him, and so on. In 1946, Hess was put on trial with the rest of the surviving leading Nazis at Nuremberg. During the trial, he came over as a pathetic, slightly deranged figure. His speech made Goering laugh. His reply to most questions was, I can't remember. But Lieutenant Airy Neve, a British officer at the trial, was not convinced by this performance. He clearly was exaggerating what amnesia he suffered from. Uh, he had uh, definite motives for doing this. Uh, for example, he felt that uh, uh, as the, the British uh, had not accepted his peace mission, that he should deceive them as much as possible. He was very upset with the British for, for what uh, they had done in not treating him seriously. And his pride was mortally wounded by this. He was very pro-British in his way. Uh, and uh, he decided that on the whole he should try and fool them as much as possible while he was in Britain. When he got to the Nuremberg trial, he found himself tried by Russians, French and Americans. Then he tended to look upon the British rather more as his friends than he had before and to try and fool the Russians. Uh, I do know that uh, visitors were brought to the Nuremberg uh, <coughs> courthouse to see him uh, in his cell who had known him well uh, prior to his flight to Scotland. And he gave quite clear indications that he really knew them uh, when they saw him, uh, but pretended not to know them, although he'd known them all, all his life. At the end of the trial, Hess was not condemned of crimes against humanity and avoided the death penalty. But he was in prison for life. Rudolf Hess. The tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. It was pressure from the Russians that secured the sentence. If Hess had succeeded, Germany would have been free to turn its might against the Soviet Union. The Russians saw to it that he served his full term in prison. To the end, Hess remained in contact with his wife. People often believe that my husband is insane. Uh, from the letters he is writing every week to the family, uh, you can uh, say that if a man who writes such letters is insane, I should be definitely insane myself. Rudolf Hess was the last inmate of Spandau prison in West Berlin, where he died at the age of 93 on the 17th of August 1987 after 40 years of imprisonment. But even his death was fraught with inconsistency. The official version was that he committed suicide by hanging himself. But some historians doubt this, claiming he was murdered. Post-mortem reports stated that marks on his neck indicate he may have been strangled. His mission in 1941 ended in disaster. Any friends he may have had within the British establishment distanced themselves from him. It was the ultimate failure for a man who risked everything. His fate sealed in a mysterious flight over 60 years ago.